be willing to do the hard things that other people won't. Stay, stay broke, Jim Hunters. That's the message. This is like Breaking Bad. This is just a Breaking I Bad <laughs> story. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Gym World Worldwide. I am your host, Dad, and I am here with Mateo Lopez and our very special guest today, Andrea Savard. How are you doing? Wonderful. I'm super excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. When we were thinking of how can we best serve gym owners, um, we were going back and forth, and we're like, we talk a lot about social media we talk a lot about content strategy. We talk a lot about Facebook ads, but some of the wealthiest and most successful gym owners we know have done really well with real estate. And so we racked our brain and thought, who has done the best in our circle using real estate as their financial lever? And your name floated to the top of the list. So we are glad you are here and willing to share your unconventional yet very helpful knowledge with uh, the gym world worldwide. I'll do so, my best. Go. Go. <laughs> oh, no. no pressure. So, um, yeah, let, let's start with uh, tell everybody about your gym when you started and how you went from, uh, presumably you started renting to, to buying your first building okay. and, and then we can get into the good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we actually started as a boxing gym way back in uh, 2005. And at the you, time, you, we box. you teach boxing. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. You're, former you're fighter. Pro. Yeah. Um, but we started, we were using a high school. So we were renting uh, a room in a high school and our cost was $20 an hour. And we went three times a week inside this high school and then eventually grew out of that into a small industrial space. And, um, eventually grew as we expanded into CrossFit. In 2008, we became uh, in a larger rental space. And I think we've made every mistake possible along the way and won some, lost some, but fought through and we're still here today. So you were, you, when did you start? When was the boxing? Boxing was 2005 was when we began as a, as a small little boxing gym. And then 08 when you got your first space and affiliated? Yeah, affiliated as a CrossFit. Still rented a space back then. Uh, we started with about 7,500 square feet, and we just kept expanding units and more units and took the next one and took the next one and took the next one. And we actually had oh, three quarters of this particular strip plaza where we were located. So we were upwards of about 12,000 square feet at the time, but it had so much unused space. We were paying you know, high rent uh, and insurance and everything, but the actual square footage that was being used was way less. So we, um, we needed to get efficient. We always wanted to buy commercial real estate. That was our reason for opening in the particular town that we're in now. But we just, we were beginners, had no idea where to start, who to start with, or anybody to kind of help guide us through. So eventually um, we started looking at, at spaces and so for the viewers, you're in Ontario, right? Like yeah. just outside of Toronto? Yeah, a little town called Milton, Ontario. Yep. Okay. So this is not, uh, you know, some people from urban markets are like, you know, buying real estate's fine. If you're in Alabama or Arkansas, this is a major uh, urban metro that we are talking about or just outside of one. And uh, as we will discuss, uh, pretty expensive real estate prices. All right. So um, was the gym just growing organic? Like, were you guys just printing money or was this like, a, you know, the business was just kind of grinding along and, and you, this was, uh, you know, real estate was the play. You're, you're trying to get it to a certain point before you could buy your first building. Uh, great question. Uh, for us, we knew that, you know, gym serves its purpose. I mean, gym is our, our passion. It's our community. It's where we grow up our family. Um, but we knew we needed a long-term retirement strategy. I was former corporate and I left that to, to work the gym. My husband's full-time, um, Toronto fire service. So we needed a retirement plan that was going to be our long-term play. And we knew that had to be real estate for us. So that was our, that was how we get started. And so when did you buy your first building? Um, Funny story, 2012, we were looking at a particular building and we're going to circle around to this one because this is the one that became a really good one for us. We first started looking at an opportunity. It was around 2012. It was a huge property, um, about four acres, about 35,000 square feet. And we were looking to purchase 
with a number of partners very early in the in the game. And so there was probably six different people trying to make this particular building come together. Ultimately, it didn't work at the 11th hour, and uh, we lost a little bit of money on the on the adventure of that part. And then we retreated back, but hadn't lost the focus on on purchasing. Um, eventually, a smaller building came available, and we looked at it. It was about 7,000, 7,500, maybe 8,000 square feet. And we looked at it, and it was probably for sale for about 750000 And we turned our noses up at it because we were 12,000 square feet, so we thought we needed big. It turned our noses up at it, and then... Probably about a year later, it came back in the market, and we re-looked at it and said, at this point now, it's going for $1.2 million. And we kind of said, ugh, there's not a lot of inventory for commercial real estate in our town at that point. So we went to look at it, and my husband is an amazing visionary. So he walked in, and he's like, I see it. We need to be here. And I'm like, I don't see it. This place is a mess. And how are we going to afford $1.2 million? But it ended up, it came together in 2014. We bought this, our first little spot. Um, so yeah. it was six years from when you moved into your first location to actually buying. Yeah. And how did, it, and how did the uh, like economics of it work? So you had to put like, how much did you have to put down? How did you find the money to do that? How did the lending process work? Like, let's just kind of go through it step by step because it, I think it's like kind of a big leap for most gym owners to, you know, Everyone wants to own their own building, but I don't think most people know what steps to take in order to do that. Hundred uh, percent. That was my question too to uh, to my husband, saying, "How are we? How do we afford this?" We had no money. I mean, we had about a hundred thousand in the bank, but um, for the business itself. But outside of that, and that was just from general operations. Um, but we, uh, I had no money saved up for a down payment. I needed three hundred thousand to uh, to put a down payment on this one but the more time you spend with people that have been through this path you learn how it works and we were able to um get some investors and we borrowed the down payment and then we were able to secure a mortgage for the remaining of it the, the people we dragged in ironically was my mom and dad so i don't want to call it the bank of mom and dad because they didn't give us the money um they actually um took out a second mortgage on their farm and they became partners in the real estate venture with us. So it's myself, my husband, my mom, and my dad. And the four of us then were able to buy this building. But we, uh, we took 50,000 equity out of my house. I borrowed 250 from my parents as the down payment. And then we had to make sure that we had a secured mortgage. The property was, was great value and, and great potential. We were going to own or operate as well inside um, so we were able to secure a, mar- a mortgage through uh, a bank and then it all came together. And because your gym was profitable, right? I'm assuming they, they looked at the numbers of your gym and said, Hey, this person's going to be able to pay the, the mortgage based off of what the gym is doing now. Right? Yeah, definitely. The gym was part of it. We had multiple companies in there. So, uh, as the real estate investment company, we had to prove that we had signed leases um, so I actually have two companies, my adult business, and then at the time I have a kid's business that was a separate P&L, separate uh, profitable company. So we had um, signed letter of intent for leases for those guys, myself, my firepower gym, and a physiotherapy company that came with us. So by having signed leases in hand, obviously the banks, knowing the value of it um, and what we were putting in, they felt that it was appropriate to lend us the money. Okay, so just hold on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have a question too. So yeah. (laughs) Sure. So you, just to recap, you borrowed money for the down payment. Yes. So you're you're borrowing for the down payment. um, And then you- But that was private funded. So it wasn't a a bank funded, but it was- Yeah, right. Your your parents borrowed and you borrowed against your house. Because you're a real estate company doing this now, right? You you created a a separate kind of real estate uh, LLC or business. All you have to show is like, oh, no, I have tenants and you're you're one of the tenants. So you just have to sign your own lease. And uh, she was two of the three. tenants. Yeah, you were two of yeah. the three tenants. So you just say, oh, look, I've got leases lined up. These businesses are going to be here paying the paying the rent. Um, and then that's how you were able to get the mortgage. 
for the for the rest of it for the rest of it. You got it. I mean, the bank needs to know that they're that the asset is secured. So of course they needed financials from all of us personally. They needed, the and we have good yeah. credit. My parents have uh, strong credit. Um, my husband and I, we've got solid credit uh, history as well, and then they sure needed to go through all of the businesses to make sure that they're viable. But yes, we can service that. Um, what we were paying in rent to the real estate company was actually less than what we were paying in rent when I had that 12,000 square foot space. Totally. So yeah. um, they could see that our business was affordable. Of course, you know, banks don't always like certain industries. Gyms is one of them that seem a little scary to them. So we had to jump through extra hoops and, and make sure that this was something that they were comfortable with, but we had a good history of operations and proof of growth in the business too. So what were you paying in rent in aggregate in the, in the old space? Uh, in the old space, we were close to 8,000 a month. Okay. And then the, what was the mortgage on the, the new space? New space, uh, brought that down to just under six. Okay. Awesome. So the bank felt pretty comfortable. You're going to be able to make yeah. the payments because you had six year operating history, basically. Yeah. On the gym. Okay. I think what people don't realize is when we got that loan for the down payment, it just simply goes in the books as a loan repayment each month. So that was easy to do. We knew we had the funds available. So now I had a mortgage payment and loan payments that were manageable and we paid ourselves back our own investment as well. And I guess uh, like now that you are a little more pro at this, a lot of people would be like, oh, I don't have rich parents or whatever. Yeah. But there are like people who do this professionally, correct? If you were there, looking to get a down payment for a yeah. building and not go to the bank of mom and dad, as you said. Yeah, a hundred percent. Now there's a couple things that I would not do going forward is that I wouldn't bring people in my own personal self. This is just our own, how we operate. Um, I would not take people's money for a percentage of the ownership in the business. I wouldn't do that. I want to maintain ownership. And in our case, we actively chose to start a company with my parents. I've obviously got a long history with my parents. We do a lot with them and they're huge supporters of the gym uh, since day one. And I would have taken a loan from a person with a, an interest. There was interest payments that went back on the original down payment loan, but I wouldn't personally take um, somebody that say, oh, here, I'll lend you 300K, but just give me 20% in the, in the building. We, that was not a path we were looking to go. Right. So it'd be structured more like a term loan. So, hey, you're gonna, I'm going to give you 300,000 and you're going to give me 10% interest on that money for 10 years yeah. or whatever. You got it. And, whatever the agreement is. Yep. And I'll hold the second position on the note. So the bank will be in first position with the mortgage. Yep. And then behind the bank, uh, you know, if you screw up or don't pay me back, I get to I'm in second position behind the bank to, to repo the actual asset. Yep. Right. OK, so that's, that's the it. way you do it. If your parents aren't going to lend you a quarter million bucks, you got to find somebody <laughs> to, to give you that first hurdle or you or you yeah. save it um, or or you move to Arkansas or Alabama where you don't need that. Yeah. Um, I just love that you're there. You're borrowing from someone who's borrowing. <laughs> That's my yes. that's my favorite part and, for, and this, no, for this down was, payment. But it was risky, right? I mean, that's the, yeah. there was the support I have from family, so we the were in that position that we've got. Say. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that, that's that's wild to me. Yeah, <laughs> you're, for the down payment, you're borrowing from someone who's borrowing. Yeah, uh, so yeah, that's that fun. made us work harder because we were yeah. not going to let this fail. It doesn't mean it was an easy ride, but we were hell bent to make this work because I knew the stakes on the flip side, we're pretty large. That's about it. You're saying it was 300,000 on 1.2 million. So it was like a 25% down payment. So that sounds yeah. about right. Um, if you're in the U S there's a, a program through the SBA. Uh, if you have a long operating history, you want to operate the building with your business where you can put down as little as 10%. So nice. uh, there are programs where you can get into a building for uh, way less than a traditional 25% down payment. I'm not an SBA an SBA expert, but we should probably interview one because um, <laughs> I, I know there are plenty of people who have gone that that route as well. Uh, also, if you're a franchise owner, um, I have talked to people at um, one of the largest SBA lending banks. It's way easier to get money as a franchise than it is as an independent gym or even like a CrossFit. So uh, if you own like an Orange Theory or an F45, you're way more bankable. Um, just 
fun fact. Okay, so did you do any build out or was the building pretty much ready to go? Oh, no, it was a dumpy old uh, grimy trucking facility that, oh yeah, we, we had to do some major uh, overhaul on it. It had a couple of shitty old bathrooms and, and stuff. We had to put change rooms in and, and structure some offices. So there was not there was definitely investment that was required. So we had to make sure our funds allowed for that as well. And so you got a loan above the, you, you got a loan above the mortgage floor. amount. Yes. Yeah. Or, sorry, the for down payment amount. Price. Above the down payments. Yeah. Ashley, remember I told you there was cash flow in, uh, in the gym, in Firepower's bank account. So we used a lot of that. Um, and it just meant it was funds flowed between one company to the other, like a loan from uh, from one company to the other. So Firepower financed a lot of the actual leasehold improvements um, that went along with that. But the gym had been had been building up cash in the bank. U.S. people, uh, most U.S. gym owners might be confused about that. If I remember correctly, at the time, there was a rule in Canada, right, where you could uh, you, you got taxed at the business level, but if you didn't distribute it out, you weren't taxed until the point you distributed it out, right? So there was an incentive to leave money in your uh, business bank account, like a tax incentive. Um, did I just I make mean, that up? I, I uh, think that you know, was the reason why question. people did that. <laughs> we just kept accumulating, like it, it was doing well. You know, we started in that I call it the mushroom growth days of CrossFit, where. You know, in the beginning, it was hard to get people aware of what this was. But then as the snowball began, like poof, the, the gym grew very quickly in uh, in financial growth, in membership growth, in staff growth, as like everything was there. So um, we were able to take advantage of that and stash some funds away in the in the bank account. And then I we're able to use that. 2013. So around this time, that was it was yeah. an awesome time to start. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so just so people get context here, like what were you doing in terms of like top line and bottom line for the gym when you when you made the jump jump? Sorry, from when, when you bought your building. Oh, uh, we were probably 75 a month, 75K a month in revenue. And then how profitable were you at that time? Mm. Numbers wise, whew. it was doing well. It was totally okay. well. I don't have a number to tell you what the actual metrics was for actual profit number, but it, it was, was uh, building well. So, so this was this was, was a high level gym. This was not. It was holding its own. Yeah. Okay. No, so you're no, no. Already, we were we were hanging crushing. in. Okay. All right. So you you, you put what a hundred grand into the build out, or was it more than that? Uh, about one twenty five, uh, okay. including build out. We had to pave the parking lot or part of the parking lot. We were trying to do things in stages, but yeah. So you're in for about 1.3, a little over 1.3, right? You got it. All right. And so you're saving money every month. And then um, and then, how did that end? When did you sell that one? So that was 2014 that we took over that building. Uh, 2017, we were approached by um, the local um, train company. And that is their division of the provincial government. And they put a call into us one Easter weekend and said, uh, looking to do some changes in this area and we're gonna be needing your property for the betterment of the town. And we're like, what does that mean? And I said, well, um, we're going to be taking over your property. Um, we'll offer you a dollar value and if you don't accept that, then we execute full expropriation. So that means they come in and whether you like it or not, they're, they're taking your property. Like eminent domain kind of a thing or? They I said to there? us, uh, they came to us in 2017 and they said, we want shovels and ground for our project by May, 2018. So you have one year to go find a place. Um, and uh, that has turned into a seven year nightmare of a process. Some good things have come, have come out of it. We'll talk about those in a minute, but yeah, that's, it's been a, an interesting, lesson into expropriation law and what that means. So basically they kick you out and you find somewhere else to go. So you don't buy real estate in areas that are good for trains. That's the, <laughs> that's the lesson. <laughs> and the town is, is growing. So train is one part of it, but our, our particular town has massive explosive growth. So this is happening all over the place as landlords are selling to developers. So it could happen whether it's the train company or not, like you could just be operating your business and Guess what? Your building's been sold for condos, so out you go. Uh, yeah. 
I mean, we had in one of our gyms in New Jersey, we had the building next to us sell. They knocked it down and built these like four million two. I think it was like two, two and a half million dollar condos. And then uh, gyms operating the entire time. People move in. They're like, it's too noisy. Uh, and we're like, well, we've been here forever. And they're like, yeah. we don't care. Too and bad. then they just like sued the living shit out of us. Yeah. And uh, yeah, forced the business to move. So yeah, um, the little guy loses. We felt the growing pains of being in a uh, in a rapid development town with a lot of change. So um, <laughs> all right. So government comes in. They're like, you're out. And you fought them, right? You're, or you're still fighting them. You still haven't received yeah. a dollar for that, have you? Well, so how this has played out, what they do is they come to you with what they think is, uh, <laughs> what they think is a fair offer. So they come to you and they offer you, Hey, we're going to pay you this. Um, if you think that's fair, great, take it and go. Um, if you don't think that's fair and you want to fight it, go get your proof and we'll go with the court process. So that's where we're at. So as you said, we bought the building 1.2, put about 125 into it. And their first offer came in at like 1.5. Um, but we've got to have a number of experts around you to show that the highest and best use of this particular property has skyrocketed. So that's where we're, we're in a bit of a, a lengthy dispute with them. But in what the meantime, it's worth? like, what are you uh, asking them for? Uh, we're asking for close to three. All right. Yeah. So that sounds like a fun legal battle. So, so this has cost you yeah. money. You still haven't received. They haven't given you one five yet. You haven't gotten anything, right? Well, what they do is they give you that initial amount. So when they came off and they said, "Here's what we're gonna we're gonna offer you: take it or leave it." Not a leave it. It's like take it, and if you think you're worth more, then go fight for more. So by doing that, what that caused is they paid out the mortgage. So the once you're gone, the, you don't have a mortgage on the building that you don't own anymore. And uh, then we've got to go find another home. Through this whole process, this is the complex part, but we have a ridiculous amount of expenses, lawyer fees, like financial uh, credit people. I've got to have money to start going to look for places. Geez, we probably looked at, and I don't mean looked at, I mean like offer on certain locations, probably 14 or 15 different um, other real estate places we were trying to find and secure for our gym. But as you know, our gyms are very, um, I'm loud. I need lots of parking. Uh, I can't be centered in town. I've got to be very cautious of residential neighbors and uh, commercial neighbors. So we need a very unique type of place. Our property also was centrally located in town. So if I have to, you know, relocate to a certain section of town that causes people's drive time to be a lot more, I'm going to lose clients. So I needed to be centrally located. And that's a very, very challenging place for us to find. We're not like a, you know, a mechanic shop that just go find a mechanic shop. Uh, we had a very unique circumstances of need for our operations. So yeah, we were off, um, my husband and I, are in a 50-50 partnership ownership of the gym. He's head coach, uh, I'm everything else, business, uh, and all the things. And this process took him out of our operations for about the last seven years while he was off chasing real estate, finding, pounding pavement, knocking on doors, looking for people that would sell, looking for places if we had to rent. So he was our, our head cheese for go find us a new home. I feel like that's the part I didn't, I underestimated. Uh, it's just like how much goes into like finding deals instead of just like passively looking on LoopNet because like by the time anything reaches like with those commercial sites has been picked over by like, you know, only the worst deals hit those sites. And so like people who are really good at this, you got uh, it, do exactly what you said. It's like sending letters, knocking doors, cold calling. And yeah. I don't think I realized that I probably, if but I was also... to get a mulligan, uh, <laughs> In my gym owning days, I probably been would have been a little more strategic and aggressive about finding a place that we could buy. And you had to have funds. So here we go back to you know finding or finding money. Gosh, we went through lines of credits or everything. Every time we went to investigate a property that may have been posted or listed, you've got to tie it up. So you've got to put an offer. Of course, it's conditional on financing and everything else that you want to put in so you can escape it. But you've got to tie this up so you have time to do your due diligence. But whenever you do an offer on these real estate properties, you have to put a deposit down. 
And in the commercial, your deposit can be, you know, 25000 50000 So every time we would try one of these properties, I've got to go find 10000 that I can drop in on this particular property. And then we've got to hustle because I've got two weeks to do my due diligence to see if it will suit our needs and if it's a, a suitable type of environment. And if that one falls through, okay, get your money back, put it back on the line of credit. Another property, this one needs 35000 Okay, shoot, go get 35000 and keep this ball rolling. So did you end up finding something? We did. Um, We finally found a place. If you recall earlier, we talked about a property back in 2012 that I was looking at purchasing with a number of friends, Uh, friends and, and, and people that were going to form a corporation together. So back in 2012, this property was available, four acres, 35,000 square feet. It was available for 2.3 million. Well, this property still was on the market. And um, in beginning of 2020, we're back, and this is the only property available. So again, in our town, developers have bought everything. So now you're at these, like the ones that have been picked over that nobody really wants. And this this property came back to us this time, it's going for 6.2 million. Oh, okay. But, I thought you were oh, saying wow. it was still available, like it was on the market for 10 years. Oh, it so was. Like, it was on the market was. for 10 years? Yeah. Yeah. Like somebody had bought it, it, didn't work for them. They had to flip it. Like, so it's still back um, in this situation. <laughs> the first time we were buying it for 2.3, we had got to know the owner and he was an old gentleman. Their, their manufacturing business had um, dissolved and he had health problems and we inexperienced, um, we were doing things wrong. We got to know him, we became friends. We started to move some of our stuff in there. Back in 2012, this particular property, 35,000 square feet, had two 15,000 square foot warehouse spaces. And in the centerpiece were, funny enough, offices and then two uh, residential apartments. So back in 2012, before we took possession, before it fell through, we actually had gone in and renovated, fully renovated one of these apartments. The guy let us in there because we needed to have rental income right away. Well, when the when the deal fell through at the last minute, we lost all of our investment on renovating that property and everything we had moved in. We had found some used equipment and stuff. He was letting us store it in this building. We were paying a rental fee. And then the deal fell through. He closed the door. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no equipment in here. Ooh, that sounds wow. pretty last minute. If you yeah. were in there renovating and swinging hammers and stuff, what what happened there? Yeah, uh, great question. We found out by, got to tell you, it's the grace of God. We found this out that it was literally the day uh, before closing that our town had this change of use fee. It's essentially a tax and it's a per square foot a dollar value they assign and where this property was located it was on the other side of the tracks where that fee applies if you're on the south side of the tracks no fee you're on the north side of the tracks there's a fee um so of course the our, we chose the one that was on the north side of the tracks the fee for that size of building was going to be five hundred thousand. it's just a Ooh. tax to just to just rezone just it so shame. you could run a it gym there. Didn't even need rezoning. It it's not anything to do with we rezoned fine. It's just called a change of use fee. So that's why the deal fell through and we had we lost our twenty five thousand dollar deposit. We lost all of our, gosh, my poor contractor, his tools and we had supplies, everything that was being stored in there, because we were inexperienced. We were trying to get in before we owned it. And you learn the hard way. So we lost about 50000 on that, but had to walk away from that deal. So and, what's the uh, lesson there? Don't renovate apartments before you own the building? Yeah, don't count your chickens before they hatch. I've never had physical stress like that in my life the day that property fell through. So did he know that and he was trying to pull a fast one? I don't think anybody really knew. It was this. It was a friend of ours that called me up and he's like, I heard about this particular situation with another building down the street. Why don't you look into it for yours? Like, I've never heard of that. And then sure enough, you make a few phone calls into the town and you realize I would have been slapped with a $500,000 bill. Yeah, we uh, we got a $50,000 zoning fee on the first gym. On our second gym in New York, it took eight years to get the CO officially due to some weird... Uh, 
licensing thing that had to do with brothels um, <laughs> that we did we had no clue about. It's called a physical culture establishment. It's like this weird archaic permit that's only for gyms in New York City and it takes a very long time to get and most gyms just like operate illegally. They just like don't get it or take a very long time like we did to get it. Uh, and then we actually moved into a gym and then got kicked out of it because of a zoning issue. So um, if you're in a business friendly state, uh, this happens a lot less frequently. But if you are in a less business friendly state, like definitely check out your zoning laws. I don't know. What, what is this the Canadian equivalent of? Like, what? how do you how do you even check? I don't even know what you're well, talking about. Well, I mean, zoning is zoning is part <laughs> like, like, of it. How do you but... avoid As a more sophisticated investor now, yeah. what kind of a diligence process do you do to make sure that um, you're not going to get slapped with a $500,000 change of use fee? You get a really good real estate agent. You have a really great lawyer. Your accountant and somebody in the city becomes your best friend. So you 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 basically traffic in the same city the whole time, right? And yeah. Just for context. All right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So, uh, so fast now we forward. have this six million dollar gym that was used to be a two million dollar building. <laughs> yeah. Now it's million. You if you could have held on to the building, you would have made four million bucks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. Wouldn't fun. that be lovely? So, but it was the only place available. So we had to jump through hoops because you can imagine, you know, we had some money that we were going to put on as a down payment. We had um, ourselves and uh, another another trucking company was going to take the other half. So Jim was going to take 15,000 square feet. Another trucking company was going to take the other 15. We had the apartments and the offices rented out or a letter of intents. So we were able to secure by the, gosh, the... Uh, skin of our teeth, we were able to secure a mortgage and some financing for this building. Um, however, we had to rely on, it was Metrolinx is the company that expropriated us. So they have to make sure that our business um, leaseholds are paid up. Like they had to pay for us to move into a new place. So we buy it January, 2020. I take possession March 2nd, 2020. And then we know it took place about two weeks later. So wait, wait, wait! Before we get to the COVID drama, this is yeah. still a lot more money, though, right? Than yeah. you did for oh. your first building. One hundred percent. So how did you how did you actually get all the money for this one? Because this is this is costing you way more. Yeah. How do you go from a one point five million dollar the city stealing your building one point five million to then upgrading to a six yeah. and a half million? Well, we were able to use some of the funds. Remember, I told you in the expropriation that they had paid off the mortgage and they had given you the first installment that they say, here's what we think your building is worth. Take it. And if you think it's worth more. So we had a little bit of a bucket in that. And that was what we were able to use as the down payment for this one. But the um, the uh, mortgage payment, obviously significantly higher, but having the letter of intent, having the you know, the lease is ready to go of companies that were going to move in there. Our staff, uh, the gym being one and the trucking company being a second one. Um, so that was, that was what was going to finance the mortgage payments of that larger building. So how much did you have to put down? Mm, I think we put down, oh boy. <sighs> I think we put down like 1.4. I was just about to say it had to be a million. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so you're scraping would... from all sources, like every possible, you know, check under the couch for coins. You're putting every dime you've got into this one. The gym is having to put um, some money in as well. And the real estate company is putting theirs in. And then we were able to get financing. Of course, our financing. Um, yeah. Financing was was a tough one. So you had paid down a decent chunk of the mortgage, I'm guessing, on the old we one. Had, yeah. We were making okay, our regular okay. payments. I see. All right, so that yeah. had paid down. So you, you you got when they made the payment for the one five, it was you got a little yeah. bit of that plus the appreciation. You got it. And then, uh, how was the remainder? Was it were you refining again, and or was there enough there that you were able to not have to take on any additional leverage? Well, I think our I mean our mortgage was oh boy, our mortgage was five point five. I think something like along those lines. It was a lot. It was a lot. We took possession, like I said, March 2nd. And then, what is it, March 12th, 13, 14? Then the world shuts down. We think it's for two weeks. Um, I had to call my banker at the middle to late March and say, like, I know we haven't made our first payment yet, but 
uh, about that first payment. Is there anything we can do here? Um, and thank God they allowed us interest only payments. Interest only at that time was still 13000 a month. So, yeah, we had to scrape by and start paying that. The intention was within the next month we were supposed to start renovations so the gym could move in there and get operating quickly. And funny enough, we started renovating the second apartment. Remember, there were two residential apartments, and so now we're renovating the second. Did you get your tools back? <laughs> yeah, did you get your tools back? On. The first apartment looked great. Now I'm doing the second one. And then our conversations with Metrolinx, the expropriator, had come to a bit of a halt. It was like everybody was AWOL and you couldn't get anybody. So we weren't able to start uh, any renovations on this building because we needed money from them. And uh, that became a heck of a process, some legal stuff, and the money never came. So from here the, we are. From the Metrolink? No, nah, yeah. We needed their money to do uh, leasehold improvements to start moving the gym in there, and that money didn't come. And we had been searching for years for a place to house the gym. So where things took a turn here is we had to make what a hell of a decision to say, I can't move the gym in there. I'm going to have to find somebody to rent this whole space or I'm going to lose this investment. And I couldn't, we couldn't afford that. But uh, so that was a very, very difficult one because we were on a time crunch to get out of our current location. We right. still hadn't moved the gym out of the expropriated right. building yet. Mm -hmm. um, however, we knew we couldn't, the gym wasn't going to be able to afford it. We couldn't move in, so it couldn't operate, and I couldn't pay that amount of rent. So um, we had to make a really difficult decision to say, okay, let's change gears quickly and find somebody to lease the entire place. Um, I'm not sure why or how, but we had cannabis companies knocking on our door. And we thought, great, I'll just have cannabis take half of it. But Health Canada regulations um, through the federal government require a cannabis grow up to be the only operating um, company in the property. Like nothing else can use the parking lot. Nothing else can be around the building. Nothing else obviously can be in the building. So we knew that those guys were potential. And this was in Canada, it's legal. And such. So we uh, used our real estate agent was very, very good and had a good network. And I tell you, it was Saturday night. She put the feelers out. And by Sunday morning, I had five different cannabis companies fighting, fighting over the space. And then who pays for the renovations then in that case? They do. These, oh. They do. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was how how hot this market was in Canada. What time and is this? Is this still... Is this this still is March or no? You're a little later. This is uh, 2020. This is now um, July 2020. So the thick of COVID and every, uh, cannabis was just crushing it. I mean, people was needed that, their yeah. weed during this time. Yeah, that right? like, every, I mean, everyone's suffering pe except <laughs> people need an eye. It's the same do. thing as a cigarette play. You know, like people, <laughs> people need. Yeah, people need to get they their need weed. Their fix. They yeah. do. So the, we. Uh, we were in a bidding war, thank God, um, from these companies, and we chose one. Um, and at their own expense, we're like, you know what you're getting into? Like, here's the shell of a building, but you got a couple nice apartments upstairs. Um, they signed the lease. They signed a five-year and paid a, a healthy, a healthy um, monthly rent to be there, and they set up shop. So that's how you got into the... The weed landlord business. Oh, yeah, now you're a drug dealer. Right? That's amazing. That's fantastic. We sure learned a like lot a, about it. This is like Breaking Bad. This is just a Breaking Bad story. <laughs> it's just basic chemistry, yo. It's it amazing. wasn't my operation, but man, we sure learned a lot about uh, about it. And wow. it's legit. Like, it's it's a legit place. And so, yeah, I cannot are, they, wait are to you visit. making money on a mortgage visit, payment now? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, we, we were. Great question. So, here's where we came to. That solved the short term, how am I going to pay my mortgage each month? Now that's, that's taken care of. So now I have a tenant in that building and they're paying rent. It is profitable each month. Um, we had to go through the, you know, give them X number of months. Um, we give them, I think, one or two months of rent free while they did their own renovations and they paid for every single thing because they've got to have 
hydro requirements and fire requirements and all the things they need. So at least, at least um, our mortgage was being taken care of. I still needed a home for the gym. Right. I was about to say, where's the gym going? (laughs) Right. So um, at that stage, then my husband is still off trying to find us a home. And uh, he found us a place um, uh, early 2021. And we came to an agreement. It was it was somebody we knew. So we had an agreement on the location. And we were going to purchase that building. Ace was ideal. Centrally located in town. Building was ideal for us. Had some outdoor space. Had lots of parking. Standalone. No residentials around. And the only way we were going to be able to buy the gym building was to sell the cannabis building. And you know what? You take an empty building and you tenant it and it's a profitable tenant with a long-term lease and that becomes a very attractive piece for investors so we were able to we sold the cannabis building and sold that in april 2021 wait 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 you found another wait what (laughs) i know well because remember our ultimate goal was to find a home for the gym yeah yeah so we had bought that that four acre property with the intention of moving the gym there, but COVID comes along, the expropriation was not going well, um, and we had to pivot, so I couldn't move the gym in there. I put a cannabis operation in, they are paying rent, They're it's profitable, it's doing well, but I still needed money. Everything I had financially was tied up in that building. She didn't solve the problem. She was just she a drug dealer. No, no, no. I know, I know that. I know that. I just want to uh, change life through fitness. But, 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 but real estate had to have gone up. Like you probably made what quite a bit for? off of what the. Did, what did you sell for? Uh, Seven point eight million. So, there and that go. was ten months. I sold it in ten months. So we bought it six point two and sold it for seven point eight with there a tenant. That's 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 the winner. There you go. So boom, you basically you more than doubled your money in 10 months yeah for that for that investment and there's still like of course you have land transfer fees and real estate fees and all that stuff so it sounds like oh my gosh you made two million you don't make two million you know by the time you have all the extra fees that come off of there yeah so what happened uh in our case so this is typical savard way is we were buying this one particular building to house the gym now in 2021 sold the cannabis building to buy that one and guess what fell through the deal. The deal. No. <laughs> deal fell through. One woman's quest to how to Where is the gym? gym? Where the is deal the gym fell now? Through. <laughs> so the gym is still sitting in the expropriated building, and I'm getting pressure from legal constantly. You got to get out. You have three months to get out. And we're like, oh, oh, I have no man. home. So we're begging for more time. Are you paying rent or are you just squatting in the old building? (laughs) Basically squatting at that point. (laughs) But um, anyway, so that deal fell through and then we panic. Um, So then we're like, okay, there's no other real estate in town. Nothing, 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 nothing. Uh, Developers have bought everything. You know, it's uh, I have to maintain a certain geography. I'm going to lose all of my members because they won't travel too far out of town. So we said, okay, what if, what if we bought a farm and we take our gym and move it to uh, a rural setting, the original CrossFit ranch style. So what did we do? We bought a 50 acre farm. Oh my God. Yeah. So that was, that was July, 2020 and buy the farm for 4.1. 2020 or 2021? Uh, 2021 this is now so yeah 2021 we buy a farm and uh before we bought the farm it sits on this environmentally protected space and we knew the it's a governing body called the niagara escarpment commission so they have regulations i talked to them multiple times before even buying hi this is the property here's the address i want to run my business out of here um, I'm going to live on the property and it had an old pro like an old, a huge old barn. It was an old horse, um, racing facility. So it had a, a quarter of a mile track and we were going to put, um, like a horse arena in the middle of the track and it was going to be ideal. And they're like, okay, that's unusual. We've, we've seen this before. Um, but here's the permitting process. All you have to do is apply this. It'll cost you that estimate it to be, you know, eight months ish for the permit, maybe 10 based on COVID. So, okay, well, we 
as long as you say we can do this, right? Yeah, it's it's unusual, but here's the process and, and it should be no problem. I also call the town. Hi, so-and-so at the town. Here's my property. Do you think this would be viable for our gym? He said, that's perfect for you guys. I said, is there any reason the town would say no? I run a block with this uh, escarpment commission. No, the, this is ideal for you guys. Okay, so... We take our 4.1 million and buy this beautiful farm. And then I sell my house because we're going to move into the farm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So now I've sold my house. Um, We've bought this farm. We take possession in the fall, October 2021. Immediately, I hire uh, a lawyer and a consultant to help us with this permitting process to get this going. So as soon as we can move this forward, my gym can move there. And I also, here's another funny, I got ourselves on a TV show. So it's a, an HGTV show called Farmhouse Facelift. And oh, they come, wow. we get chosen because this is a beautiful yes. old century farm. Oh my God. And I take possession of the farm. We have it for, oh boy, 15 days. And by then we already realize the consultant and the lawyer team have found out there is a 50-50 chance you're going to be able to move your gym here. Ugh. So we were not told accurate information. The, the consultant said, I've seen this before in the same geography area. A yoga studio wanted to have their operations in an old barn. And after fighting with this particular commission for the better part of three years, they were allowed one room in their house, not even in the barn. Oh, no. So that's what we're mm. facing. And we could not um, take that risk. I couldn't take a risk of moving the gym there and having it all collapse and not being able to operate. So I own the place. And about 15 days into owning this farm, we realized I got to put this farm up for sale. And had to cancel the TV show. They had already no! started coming filming. <laughs> yeah. They already started coming and filming, so we had to cancel oh. the TV show. Like, no. Steve, we got um, bad news. You, you got to get out of the barn. <laughs> no. <laughs> Pretty much. And, uh, oh, yeah, bonkers, right? So I had sold my house, right? Yeah. And now I'm going to be homeless. So, again, we put our real estate agent on the case, and we thankfully were able to catch a, a buyer. Again, developers with deep pockets know what this geography of our town's coming to. So they bought it, uh, and we were able to sell it for about 4.5. So we covered our expenses, we covered everything and covered the renovations we'd already started on the farm. And then we had to find a house. <laughs> so at this point, well, like, if, how is the real estate now? Is it going crazy at this it's point crazy. too? So, yeah. so you're like three years into real estate and you've made a couple million bucks off of that. Yeah. And you're like 15, 16 years into gym ownership. And you probably, like, have you made more from real estate at this point than you have from just, like, operating the gym the entire time? Oh, 100%. I mean, that's, that is the retirement plan. I mean, the gym has always been a passion project. It is a full-time job for me. We have 24 staff. Um, like, we've got a good operation going. And the, thank God the key for all of this is we can go off and do some of these crazy adventures and find new locations and find stuff because I've got a wicked team that handles the gym. I'm still around. I still coach boxing. I still love being there. Um, but I have amazing staff that can hold the fort for us while we dabble. So wait, are you homeless or there's more? <laughs> we were able to find them. I'm, I'm in a beautiful house now. Thank goodness. It's a small little spot in the country, but it was a vacant property. So as we were panicking, we found a home that was vacant and had a, a quick turnaround and it's, it's turned out well. And then, because we still had the funds from the sale of the cannabis building that hadn't been invested yet, we bought ourselves uh, an apartment building. So now we're, we bought a, I think there's nine units in that one. And then we just bought another triplex in the next town over that closed uh, about a month ago. But where's the gym going? So <laughs> we still have to find a home for the gym. You're going to laugh at this one. Oh this is, my this gosh. is bonkers. So the gym still needs a home. Um, we were able to move. We had to get out because they were leveling the expropriation property, which has been wiped out and gone now. By uh, a, a weird turn of events, do you remember the building we were buying that fell through? Um, the one that was centrally located in town had all the outdoor space. Well, yes. we begged and pleaded. It's our friend that owns the building. Owned, sorry, a developers bought it, but... Um, 
he had a small little warehouse space and an unused call center in the center of this building. So we begged him, can I rent this space? And we made it work. It's only about 5,000 square feet. So the gym is currently in that location renting. Um, however, it's a demolition clause on that lease. So I only have three more years. I have to move again. So we still continue the trying to find where we're going to land the gym. We'll find a spot. There's, there's places, but rent rates have tripled for half of the space. Meaning what I used to pay $6,000 for, um, at our old spot is going for mm, 18, $20,000 a month in rent space. So we've got to be able to find a location that we can purchase. So that's what we're still doing. The real estate continues, but we finally got to a realization that our investment investing as real estate people can go beyond the gym ownership space. If well, it never got there in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Still, yeah, you're yeah. just doing apartments now. It never yes. began. <laughs> so yeah, so that's it. It sounded like it so it sounds like this wasn't like a like the there's a series of plays that wasn't part of this like grand strategic plan, no. right? It was just like I need a place to find my gym and then you just happen to and stumble upon millions of dollars. So like now it sounds like you're a little more strategic. Um, yeah. What's your what's your general strategy, like real estate strategy, look like now that you're a, a, a grizzled veteran, uh, got some got some scars. Yeah, we definitely got a lot of battle scars. Now we look at it to say what is the best uh, investment, and they don't have to be long term. We used to say I'm going to be here forever, and now I'm like, okay, what am I going to be? How long am I going to be at this type of place? Um, and not looking at it like it's a forever. I look at it like I've got some money invested. Real estate is continuing to rise. If I find something more appropriate, I'll sell that one and move on. So I don't look at them as super long-term holds right now. Initially, when we got into the game and bought our very first property for 1.2 million, we looked at that place like a 25 year hold. I'm going to sit on this till I retire. And when I'm you know 70 years old, then I'll sell it. And that'll be my, what I live off of. But now we're realizing real estate is just a flip game. Flip, 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 move on, flip, move on. So what do you look for now? We look for, uh, well, I, I'm still looking for a place to hold the gym. So we look for a place that is. <laughs> so you know, we have a house of parking, <laughs> yeah. but still in the city, but quiet enough where you won't bother yeah. anyone. So just looking yeah. for that. Looking for those. Uh, outside of that though, um, you know, our real estate um, experience has grown. I'm looking for places that can run themselves. I'm looking for places that uh, either I can get a tenant in because that was the winning strategy for the cannabis place. Take an empty, shitty old building and get a tenant in there. And then I can flip it to somebody else because they're already going to be making money if I don't want to long term hold it. So we're open to anything. So let's talk about a little. Let's talk about that a little bit, um, because if you're unfamiliar with the commercial real estate market, uh, like the way houses are valued is like comps, right? So it's just like if my house sold for five hundred thousand and my neighbor's house sold for five hundred and fifty thousand, and then the house across the street was listed and it had similar features, that would be uh, you know five hundred and twenty-five thousand or something along there. Where like uh, commercial, if I understand it, is just it's all based off of cash flow, right? Yeah. So you can take a building and buy it for three million, but if you get some tenant to pay you something where it's like you know, uh, where the rent creates like an attractive enough return profile, mm -hmm. you can then turn around and sell it for like ten million three weeks later with a signed lease, right? If it's got a good cap rate, and that's, again, that's out of my area because I have financial people that help us with these. But if it's got uh, either tenants in there and they're paying a fair rate that's going to cover your mortgage and then some, like all your expenses, then that's an investment I want where it's cash flow positive. Uh, and if it's not, then what are the lease terms? Can you get those guys out and bring somebody else in at a higher lease rate, um, whether it's commercial or residential? Commercial is a better one. I like commercial better because I don't have to deal with residential laws. Um but ultimately, you know, what's the current rent status of that building and how can they make it better? And so for now, is the the next play just 
find a place for the gym or is the next play just whatever comes along you that, that seems like a decent return profile you'll buy a bit of both to be honest with you where we've got a, a few leads on places for the gym i still have another i think three years left of my current location um but now my husband turned into like he he looks through real estate like most people look through instagram he's constantly he knows everything about what's coming up what's available and then we have a really great team around us so if we need to move very quickly i've got our agent i've got financial people um and and we've got our strategy ready to go and since you've done a few deals now do you get more like uh inbound stuff sorry like do, what do you mean like do brokers call you and send you listings before they hit like do you get any choice deals yeah i think uh i wouldn't say choice deals per se maybe some condos like we we have we own a small condo in mississauga that was a new bill that you can get in at the grassroots level before it goes public we got one of those on the side um but we definitely have a network of people now that hey i know so and so is looking for something hey i know savards are looking for or this might be something that interests you so uh you're still in our town based on our geography because we're in the greater toronto area you know there's all the good stuff's picked taken by developers with big pockets or places that you know would be a really good buy one day but you have to be able to have the funds to sit on it for 10 years until the the local like zoning changes or anything like that those some people have big dollars to sit i don't so we have to be much more strategic on ours still scraping the bottom yep small so, fish in a big pond so if you're a gym owner who's profitable and you want to get into real estate and you want to own your building and you want to make millions of dollars what's kind of the steps you take what's the advice you would give somebody if uh i, I mean i'm assuming you do mentor people that like you are a mentor uh, a gym mentor. So I'm assuming you do mentor people on this. Like what is the advice you give? I'll tell you step one is talk to everybody. Talk to everybody who's done this, take them out for coffee and ask their story because everybody's got a story like mine. A unique story of expropriation triggered our need to go find um, a new space. Um, but how the deals were put together, learn from so many different people. How did you structure that particular deal? How did you come up with your initial down payment? How did you come up uh, with your ability to pay a mortgage of that amount? Um, why is it better for the gym to be uh, in a mortgage versus a rent? I'll take a mortgage any day because I can, if I have the ability and I have other subleasers in my space, great, they're contributing to the overall pay. But then my gym can pay less of, uh, of a rent, if that makes sense, if I choose to. But I can play that game now. So step one, we did this. We, we found some very, very successful friends who we trusted what they were doing. We trusted that they were telling us they're honest how they did it for themselves. We weren't asking anything of them. I wasn't asking for loans. I wasn't asking for any favors. I just wanted to pick their brains on how did you make this deal come together? And then with your strategic team, lawyers, accountants, uh, financial advisors, and your real estate agent, um, how did this, how, and what is the best a path for you to do that for yourself? How much do you need to get started? Maybe the gym has a uh, hundred grand saved up. Is that enough? 200 grand? Is that enough? Do you go after just a, a small warehouse? You go after a small apartment triplex, like you said, like what, well, what's enough to get started? <sighs> I mean, that's, that's a difficult question to answer because every market is different and everybody's intention is different. Our intention was to find a spot for the gym. That was our primary, um, because I'm still super involved in our gym. Like that's still, we don't have any uh, plans to, to sell or, or right now or to move on. Like this is, this is our livelihood and I still need that as a job. So we were seeking a space specifically for that. Um, but that got us comfortable with the process of how this all works and how who do you need to make a deal happen and how you can make this this work and eventually it has led to other opportunities for owning outside you don't have to find a place for your gym if that's not your interest and you simply want to buy into some real estate but good lord start small um start small you don't need to pop into a, a six million dollar building off the hop 
Um, it's got to be manageable. Just like, you know, everybody, as your kid, you're afraid of $100. And then as you get older, you're like $1,000 is scary. Then 10000 becomes scary. The more you play at that upper level, then you become more comfortable. Um, for us, a million dollars was holy shit, like this is beyond anything I can comprehend. And now my threshold for fear is, is going up and up and up. So, um, but there's not like the physiological stress of jumping into a monster, like investment that you could lose everything. That's not a place I want to stay. I don't want to, I want to sleep at night. Me too. Yeah. (laughs) I got some cannabis for you if you do. (laughs) Amazing. Perfect. Uh, what do what do you get asked a lot on calls? I think you, what I would always ask recommend. you about this first of all because I, I know you never like really this will be the first time you ever like spoken publicly about it. Yeah, it's definitely not something I I, I talk a lot about because it it's I don't want people to think it's you know high rolling. It was a lot of moving parts had to come together. It was a lot of stress. A lot, like if you're a faith-based person, it was a heck of a, a lot of prayers on our end. And it was a lot of what ifs could go wrong. But, you know, I had a really great mentor with Jeff Smith and the Tinker Program when before we bought this $6 million building. And I, he knew all about our previous, could have purchased it and all of our stuff going on. He knew everything about our, our firepower business. And... Uh, you know, he gave me some advice that I'll never forget. And he said, be willing to do the hard things that other people won't. And that stuck with me. Um, we said, okay, we'll take on this weird building that everybody avoided. Why was everybody avoiding this one particular four acre property? Because it had floodplains and it was by train tracks and it was just a weird spot. But we were willing to do the hard work to make this come together. And even when, you know, shit hit the fan all around us, you hunker down and be willing to do the work that other people aren't to make this happen because we needed, like, this was everything we had. We're a small, like I'm not a wealthy family. My parents aren't wealthy. We're just good old hardworking people that see potential and see a vision um, and made it happen. So at no point have you thought about selling your gym? I think that's the long-term play. I mean, when we first bought our our first building, the original plan was like, we'll have the gym. And eventually when we're done playing gym, we'll sell it. We'll still be around in the community, but maybe we won't take the lead on operating it. But the gym would operate as one of the tenants in the building that we own. Um, And I, that's always been kind of our vision. So however that evolves, that will still be the plan. Yeah. Yeah. But we won't, we'll never ever own property under the gym's name that is one of my absolute never ever in gym owners never buy your building under your gym's name um you've got to have it as a separate investment company a separate numbered company whatever that looks like in in your country so for, for us liability. it's a numbered company um they just need to be separate separate financed i mean at the same time of course liability somebody you know, falls and breaks the neck off a pull-up rig and they sell, sorry, they sue your company, well, they can take your building. Um, But if I don't own the building, I only own a a company that's got 50 Gs in the bank, then that's all they can take. They can't take the rest of the stuff. So it's a protection. It becomes part of a tax game as well, shifting money between companies and, you know, one loans another one, pays another one back. So it becomes all that too. I think in the States to take advantage of an SBA uh, loan, which is the easiest way to get started, um, you have to do it through the the entity, the, the the business entity, which is tough. But yes, I understand what you are saying where uh, your business gets sued, which happens a lot with gyms, uh, and you lose and insurance doesn't cover it. Uh, yeah, they can take your building. It's a hard asset. So stay, stay broke, gym owners. That's the message. Stay broke. Amazing. I think that's everything they're going to like. Thanks for watching. Tune in next week. Be sure to like subscribe, leave a comment and stay broke friends.